you'd like to turn to the book of Judges and chapter 6. Page 407, Judges chapter 6. To read a lengthy passage here. It's the account of Gideon. I read from verse 1. The sons of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. And the Lord gave them into the hands of Midian seven years. And the power of Midian prevailed against Israel. Because of Midian, the sons of Israel made for themselves the dens which were in the mountains and the caves and the strongholds. For it was when Israel had sown that the Midianites would come up with the Amalekites and the sons of the east and go against them. So they would camp against them and destroy the produce of the earth as far as Gaza and leave no sustenance in Israel as well as no sheep, ox or donkey. They'd come up with their livestock and their tents. They'd come in like locusts for number. Both they and their camels were innumerable and they came into the land to devastate it. So Israel was brought very low because of Midian. And the sons of Israel cried to the Lord. Now it came about when the sons of Israel cried to the Lord on account of Midian, that the Lord sent a prophet to the sons of Israel. And he said to them, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, It was I who brought you up from Egypt, brought you out from the house of slavery, and I delivered you into the hands of the <coughs> from the hands of the Egyptians and from the hands of all your oppressors and dispossessed them before you and gave you their land. And I said to you, I am the Lord your God. You shall not fear the gods of the Amorites in whose land you live, but you have not obeyed me. Then the angel of the Lord came and sat under the oak that was in Ophrah, which belonged to Joash the Abiezrite, as his son Gideon was beating out wheat in the winepress in order to save it from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, The Lord is with you, O valiant warrior. Then Gideon said to him, O oh my Lord, if the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? Where are all his miracles which our fathers told us about, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and given us into the hand of Midian. And the Lord looked at him and said, Go in this your strength and deliver Israel from the hand of Midian. Have I not sent you? And he said to him, O Lord, how shall I deliver Israel? Behold, my family is the least in Manasseh, and I'm the youngest in my father's house. But the Lord said to him, Surely I will be with you, and you shall defeat Midian as one man. So Gideon said to him, If now I've found favor in thy sight, then show me a sign that it is thou who speakest with me. Please do not depart from here until I come back to thee and bring out my offering and lay it before thee. And he said, I will remain until you return. Then Gideon went in and prepared a kid and unleavened bread from an ephod of flour. He put the meat in a basket and the broth in a pot and brought them out to him under the oak and presented them. And the angel of the Lord said to him, Take the meat and the unleavened bread and lay them on this rock, and pour out the broth. And he did so. Then the angel of the Lord put out the end of the staff that was in his hand, and touched the meat and the unleavened bread, 
and fire sprang up from the rock, consumed the meat and the unleavened bread. Then the angel of the Lord vanished from his sight. When Gideon saw that he was the angel of the Lord, he said, Alas, Lord God, for now I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. The Lord said to him, Peace to you. Do not fear. You shall not die. Then Gideon built an altar there to the Lord and named it, The Lord is Peace. To this day, it is still in Ophrah of the Abiezrites. Now the same night it came about that the Lord said to him, Take your father's bull and a second bull seven years old. Pull down the altar of Baal which belongs to your father. Cut down the Asherah that is beside it. And build an altar to the Lord your God on the top of this stronghold in, or in an orderly manner. Take a second bull, offer a burnt offering with the wood of the Asherah, which you shall cut down. Then Gideon took men, ten men of his servants and did as the Lord had spoken to him. And it came about because he was too afraid of his father's household and the men of the city to do it by day. He did it by night. When the men of the city arose early in the morning, behold, the altar of Baal was torn down. And the Asherah which was beside it was cut down, and the second bull was offered on the altar which had been built. And they said to one another, Who did this then? When they searched about and inquired, they said, Gideon, the son of Joash, did this thing. Then the men of the city said to Joash, Bring out your son, that he may die. For he's torn down the altar of Baal, and indeed... He's cut down the Asherah, which was beside it. But Joash said to all who stood against him, Will you contend for Baal? Or will you deliver him? Whoever will plead for him shall be put to death by morning. If he's a god, let him contend for himself, because someone's torn down his altar. Therefore on that day he named him Jeroboam. That is to say, let Baal contend against him, because he'd torn down his altar. Then all the Midianites and the Amalekites and the sons of the east assembled themselves. They crossed over and camped in the valley of Jezreel. So the Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon, and he blew a trumpet, and the Abiezrites were called together to follow him. And he sent messengers through Throughout Manasseh, they also were called together to follow him. He sent messengers to Asher, Zebulun, and Naphtali, and they came up to meet them. Then Gideon said to God, If thou wilt deliver Israel through me, as thou hast spoken, behold, I'll put a fleece of wool on the threshing floor. If there's dew on the fleece only, and it <clears throat> is dry on all the ground, then I'll know that thou wilt deliver Israel through me, as thou hast spoken. And it was so. When he arose early the next morning and squeezed the fleece, he drained the dew from the fleece, a bowl full of water. Then Gideon said to God, Do not let thine anger burn against me, that I may speak once more. Please, let me make a test once more with the fleece. Let it now be dry only on the fleece, and let there be dew on all the ground. And God did so that night, for it was dry only on the fleece, and the dew was on all the ground. Then Jeroboam, that is Gideon, and all the people who were with him, rose early and camped beside the spring of Herod, and the camp of Midian was on the north side of them by the hill of Morah in the valley. And the Lord said to Gideon, The people who are with you are too many for me to <clears throat> give Midian into their hands, lest Israel become boastful, saying, 
My own power has delivered me. Now therefore come, proclaiming the hearing of the people, saying, Whoever is afraid and trembling, let him return and depart from Mount Gilead. So 22,000 people returned, but 10,000 remained. Then the Lord said to Gideon, The people are still too many. Bring them down to the water, and I'll test them for you there. Therefore, it shall be that he of whom I say to you, this one shall go with you, he shall go with you. But everyone of whom I say to you, this one shall not go with you, he shall not go. So he brought the people down to the water, and the Lord said to Gideon, You shall separate everyone who laps the water with his tongue, as a dog laps, as well as everyone who kneels to drink. Now the number of those who lapped put in their hand to their mouth was three hundred men. But all the rest of the people kneeled to drink water. And the Lord said to Gideon, I will deliver you with the three hundred men who lapped, and will give the Midianites into your hands, so let all the people go, each man to his own home. So the three hundred men took the people's provisions and their trumpets in their hands, and Gideon sent all the other men of Israel, each to his tent, but remained, sorry, retained the three hundred men, and the camp of Midian was below him in the valley. Hope you're familiar with something of the account, because... Gideon and his 300 men indeed disperse and scatter by the power of God, the Midianites and the children of the East. And I want us to think a little bit this morning about the characteristics of a man that God uses in times of apostasy. And Gideon is the perfect example we're living in times of apostasy. We're living in the last days before the return of Jesus. And there will be a great falling away, a great apostasy. And not only is the world <coughs> fixed on the great achievements of man, not only is there that spirit of Babylon in the world which loves to exalt man, it's invaded the church. It's invaded the church. So there is this awful, arrogant, boastful pride which loves to point to man instead of to the Lord Jesus Christ. We're living in such times. This is why God could not use a great army. This is why God could not use a great company. This is why God took the lowly man. This is why God took small, a small army so that Israel would not exalt itself against the Lord. We're living in such days, dear friends. And so I believe there are lessons for us. We've been using Psalm 83 much in our prayer meetings. Very relevant psalm to the days in which we live regarding what God is doing in the land of Israel. And it specifically refers to this <clears throat> account of the Midianites and Zeba and Zalmunna and such. So there's a direct relevance to this. If you read on in the passage, you'll find that some of the, um, some of the spoil it involved um, garments with crescent ornaments. Sounds rather familiar, doesn't it? There's nothing new, dear friends, under the sun. So I believe that there are lessons here which are very important for us. And I just want to take out seven things, seven characteristics this morning of a man that God uses in times of apostasy. And the first one is from verse 13. Gideon is a man who seeks after God. He's a man who inquires of God. If God is with us, why are we in such a mess? 
I wonder if you've ever asked the Lord that. If God is with us, he is Emmanuel, isn't he not? God with us. If Jesus is Emmanuel, he's promised to never leave us or forsake us. If he is in our midst, King of kings and Lord of all lords, all authority given unto him, if that's the case, why are we in such a mess? And if I ask you that question this morning, can you give me an answer? Well, Gideon had that question. And so where did he take it? He took it to the Lord, dear friends. If the Lord's with us, why are we in this mess? Why am I having to beat out wheat in, in a wine press from the Midianites? Why am I desperately trying to preserve food for the people of God if we're supposed to be on the victory side? Why? What are you doing, Lord? I want to understand what you're doing. Are you asking the Lord that these days, dear friends? Lord, what are you doing? In the midst of all this that's going on now. Our own country seems, seems to be so divided. Almost on the point of civil. What are you doing Lord in the midst of all this? Where is God in this? Are you asking him? Because God will use people who are inquiring of him who want to understand, who want to see what God is doing. God has always done that, and God will do that in these coming days. Are you asking the Lord? Are you inquiring of the Lord? Are you beseeching the Lord that he will open your eyes so that you can see, where is the Lord? Where's God in this? You could be going through all kinds of things within your family situation, perhaps within your job situation. Where's the Lord in this? Are you asking him? Where's God in this? We need to be inquiring of the Lord, dear friends. And God will use people who are looking for him, who are seeking him. Let me give you an example. Turn to Exodus and chapter 3. Similar kind of a thing. The people of God are in a mess and they begin to cry out to the Lord in their distress. And God hear, hears them. And who's he going to choose to use in that situation? Well, there's a man called Moses. Exodus chapter 3. He was a good willing volunteer, this man. He was ready to deliver the people of Israel from Egypt, wasn't he? One by one, if necessary. Well, God had to take him away, put him in a wilderness for 40 years and empty him out. Until he didn't think he could do anything. Is that what God has to do with you? And then God appears to him. Verse 2. The angel of the Lord appeared to him in a blazing fire from the midst of the bush. And he looked and behold, the bush was burning with fire, yet the bush was not consumed. And Moses said, what? I must turn aside now and see this marvelous sight why the bush is not burning up. And the Lord saw that he turned aside to see. You see that? Why did God choose this man? He recognized God was doing something. God was in this thing somewhere. And he was turned aside to understand what God was doing. And what God wanted to speak to him. And when God saw that this man turned aside to see. Then God spoke to him. Are you turning aside? Are you seeking God? To understand. To see what God 
is wanting to do in the midst of all the chaos that we're in, in these days? Are you turning aside? Are you seeking him? Are you inquiring of him? Are you asking him, where is the Lord in this? Because God chooses the man who's looking for him and who wants to understand and wants to see. As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. As it was in the days of Lot. What happened in the days of Lot? There was one man, dear friends, and his name was Abraham, Abraham, as he was to become. And God's wrath was kindled. The abominations of sodomy, the wickedness, God can hardly conceive that people can become so wicked and demonized as to turn man with man and woman with woman. It's wickedness, dear friends. God is so horrified, he comes down. And what does he say? Shall I hide from Abram what, what I'm about to do? There's a man here. I'm going to have to bring judgment. But there's one man I can talk to about this. There's one man who'll want to deal with me about this. And his name is Abraham. And God has some dealings with the Midianites and the Amalekites. And he knows there's one man, dear friends. That's it. Only one. There's just one man that he can come to and is going to inquire and say, I want to see what God is doing. And what's the way out of this mess? We need to be like that, dear friends. We need to have an inquiring heart. We believe in the sovereignty of God, don't we? But that's not a fatalistic kind of a thing. We need to inquire of the Lord. What are you doing, Lord? What do you want to do in this situation? Because the prayers of a righteous man availeth much. Amen? Yes. Amen. Did the prayers of Abraham change anything? Yes. Amen. One man. And God knew who he was. One man who would inquire and go and stand before God. Are you going to be that one man in your situation? What else? Verse 15. Gideon was small enough for God to use. What's God's problem in days like today? He can't find people small enough to use. Just can't find them. Moses wasn't small enough for him to use. Until he'd spent 40 years in a wilderness with some mangy sheep. What does God have to do with us, dear friends? Until we're small enough for him to use. It's always been God's way. Mark chapter 1. God needs a voice. Of one crying in the wilderness. To prepare the way of the Lord. Well I'm sure there must be some high priests. Some dignitaries. Well there was. But God couldn't use them. Why? They weren't small enough dear friends. They weren't humble enough. For God to use. Mark 1 verse 7. 
John was preaching, saying after me, One is coming who's mightier than I. I'm not fit to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. Remember? I think we looked at that. can't remember if it was a sermon or one of our Bible studies. But The lowest one, the lowest servant, washed the feet. The next to the lowest unfastened the shoes for him to do it. What was John saying? I'm nowhere near as humble as my blessed Saviour who's going to baptise you with the Holy Spirit and die for your sins. I'm not worthy to sit at the side of him and unfasten shoes before he washes them. I'm not worthy. Dear friends, we're not worthy to preach this blessed gospel. We're not worthy for this amazing book to be upon our lips. We're not worthy to serve the one who stretched forth the heavens, who created everything and then emptied himself and is now given the name above every name. We're not worthy to serve him. Do you believe that? Because I don't think most of the church does. And that's why God's not going to use most of the church. Gideon didn't think he was worthy. Gideon didn't think he could do it. And that qualified him. Moses didn't think he could speak for God. That qualified him. Jeremiah didn't think he could speak for God. He thought he was too young and insignificant. The people would never listen to him. It qualified him for the job, dear friends. And God's looking around the church and he can't find people who qualify. He can't find anyone small enough to use. He can't find anyone that when he uses them and does extraordinary miracles will still give honour and glory to him and not take any for themselves. Number three. Gideon was a man who wanted to make an acceptable offering to God. Make an acceptable offering to God. Do you want to make an acceptable offering to God? We should have as our ambition, it says in 2 Corinthians, to please him. He pleased the Father. That's the basis that we can be forgiven. God looked upon the anguish of his soul and was pleased. He was satisfied. His son had come and done everything that was required of him and finished it. Gideon wanted to make an offering that was acceptable. Please just wait, Lord. I want to present an offering that is pleasing to you. Dear friends, there's only one offering that God's after. And it's there in Hebrews chapter 12. God wants you to present your body as a living sacrifice on the altar. He wants you to offer everything. All to Jesus I surrender. That's all he wants. He doesn't want our best efforts. He doesn't want our wonderful plans. He doesn't want our best schemes and our bright ideas. He wants our bodies offered as a living sacrifice and surrendered on the altar before Jesus. And that offering, God will accept. Gideon wanted to make an acceptable offering. And he brought his best out, put it on the rock. He just placed it on the rock. 
You know, he who falls on the rock is going to be broken. God wants us broken, dear friends. He wants us offered up. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. A broken and a contrite heart God will not despise. What does God want to do in your life? He wants to break you, dear friends. He wants you to fall upon the rock and be broken. And when you are, he'll, he'll consume that. He'll, he'll accept it. He'll take the whole thing and use it. What else? Number four. This man feared God. This man feared God. Alas, Lord God. There was a man with a sense of awe and the fear of God. Let's look at some scripture. Isaiah 57. <clears throat> page 1178. Isaiah 57 and verse 15. Thus says the high and exalted one who lives forever, whose name is holy. I dwell on a high and holy place. Well, we'll never get there, will we? Who may ascend the hill of the Lord? Who's going to get up there? Well, who else will he dwell with? He'll also dwell with the contrite and lowly of spirit in order to revive the spirit of the lowly and revive the heart of the contrite. God will meet with people when they're broken. Psalm 34. Verse 18, the Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. How are we going to see God's mighty deliverances? Be broken in spirit. Isaiah 66 and verse 1. Thus says the Lord, Heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. Where then is a house you could build for me? Where's a place that I may rest? For my hand made all these things. Thus all these things came into being, declares the Lord. But to this one I will look. To him who is humble and contrite in spirit and who trembles at my word. Was that Gideon? Yes. We need a fresh fear of God, dear friends, in these days. Gideon was in awe that the angel of the Lord had visited him. What else do we see about this man? Verse 24. The Lord is his peace. Isn't that wonderful? The Lord is his peace. What's your peace? Oh, we looked at Philippians, didn't we? Last, was it last week? Philippians chapter 4. The peace which passes comprehension will garrison your heart and mind in Christ Jesus when what when you're anxious for nothing, nothing. and in everything by prayer with supplication and thanksgiving you make your requests known unto God that's the method but what's the answer 
The answer is the Lord himself, dear friends. Do you understand? The Lord is our peace. It's not a thing, it's a him. He is our peace. He's broken down every wall, as that beautiful song says. He is our peace. We draw near to him and he draws near to us. And when we're walking closely with the Lord, we're walking in peace. He's the Prince of Peace, isn't he? He's our peace, dear friends. And don't we need him in these days? We're going to need him even more. And we need to learn now, the Lord is peace. The Lord's my peace. And we need to learn that in a very real way, dear friends. Just a couple more. This man was ready to tear down the idols in his own house. Have you ever asked the Lord, honestly and humbly, Lord, are there any idols in my life? Is there anything in my life which is a substitute for you? In any area of my life, Lord, will you show me? Because I've got the sledgehammer out and I know what to do with it. And I urge you, go before the Lord and ask him, are there any idols in my life? Are there idols in my home? Are there things in my life which are a substitute for you. A substitute. That's what an idol is. It's taking the place that God should have. Lord, are there any idols in my life? Because I want to tear them down. Gideon tore down the idols of his household. God can use a man like that. One last characteristic of this man. Gideon obeyed the Lord. He wanted to be sure it was God that was telling him. God knows, dear friends. If you think God's telling you to do something and, it, and it's something major in your life, then you're perfectly in order to seek the Lord for some confirmation. God's not unreasonable. But if you know God's telling you to do something, do it. If you know that God's telling you to go, go. And God has told us, dear friends, to go, hasn't he? Go into all the world. I'm a bit grieved and challenged, I have to say, because as, as we know, Dick's not so well these days, and obviously Keith <clears throat> is uh, rather aged, and the outreach which has been going for years in Lancaster, I think there were three people. That, dear friends, is tragic. Yes. That is grievous. We've been commanded to go into all the world and make disciples to preach the gospel. Three people in Lancaster. Can God find someone small enough, broken enough, earnest enough in seeking him? Someone who's going to trust him? Someone who's going to offer themselves day after day after day after day? And someone 
when God tells them to go, will go. Because that's what God is looking for. They're the characteristics of a man that God will use in Gideon's day and I believe in our day. Amen? Amen. May God find some. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you for your word. We thank you for this, this account of the Midianites, Lord, and the children of Israel crying out to the Lord. And Lord, the man that you took, not perfect, but a broken man, small enough for God to use, who wanted to please you who was willing to turn aside and seek you, and a man who in the end obeyed and went. Lord, may you find such ones among us in these days for your glory and for the sake of the gospel. Lord, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.